Warning, this video will absolutely have bright flashing lights and loud noises. Something you should know. I'm not a real tyrannoid. <laughs> Will you lose your lunch if you have to watch one more reality dating show? Is your blog's gone wild video scratched from overuse? Then it's time to turn that dial to something a little more dangerous. Time for some real action. It's time to blow it up! That's right, it's time for Dread Zone, the galaxy's number one uncensored, unethical, and completely underground combat sport. Blasting straight at you, live from the Battle Dome. And now, on pay per view, watch as Ratchet and Clank take on Ace Hardlight and the Exterminators. They save the galaxy three times over, but how long can they survive in the zone? Catch it live, right here, on Vox. Gladiatorial combat is a great theme to push a Ratchet and Clank game with. Combat arenas were already a mainstay in most Ratchet and Clanks, full of optional challenges with a plethora of rewards. Making an entire title out of that minigame is a logical evolution. Deadlocked oozes style and charm, with its announcers making sure to apply loads of atmosphere that the series is already known for. With the period appropriate hardcore, edgy look for the visual design, from menus to the protagonist's new armor, the game is trying to appeal to the very audience who would watch Dread Zone itself. Level intros are a UI overlay, a voice clip, a hype building song, and a shot of the entire level every time. It's a surprisingly simple and effective way to convey the theme that also pulls double duty by informing the player of their gameplay route. Deadlock follows the usual overarching plot ideas. Space capitalism gets out of hand yet again. Gleeman Vox, the antagonist this time around, is a very obvious personification of the Fox media empire as it stood at the time. The tide goes in, tide goes out. He's very much a powerful, hypocritical, selfish, grubby, money-hungry, surface-level person, hell-bent on selling a bunch of useless crap and advertising to as many idiots as he possibly can. He has no limit to how low he will go to make money. Vox literally markets psychopathic murderers to children on television. The commercialization of ex-heroes sells the theme and tone to you not even an hour into gameplay. Which is a little ironic, because Ratchet himself isn't exactly a paragon of morality per se. There's a line where Dallas, an announcer for Dread Zone, says Ratchet has spent time in prison. And this is technically true. In Going Commando, he was sorta of, kinda arrested for attempted assassination. He's also been known to use completely black market goods in order to save the universe. In my opinion, that little tiny bit of gray area is what makes Ratchet interesting as a character. But you know the deal by now. It's your job to put an end to this sector space capitalism gone wrong at all costs. The game is extremely simple on paper. You select a mission from a list, you do the mission. However, they're so loaded with story and cutscenes that even though this technically isn't a mainline Ratchet and Clank and it's an arena shooter spinoff, it still feels like an organic continuation. The story and characters in this entry assume a prerequisite knowledge of the previous titles. While the antagonists are entirely new, there are also many references to the rest of the series that is good flavor for returning players. The character epilogues and the extras menu is Something I never read before filming this review. It's really cool to find out what happened to the side characters. Dallas and Juanita, Treadzone's zany announcers, accidentally got married and did their own reality TV show about it. The combat bots became burger chefs and lived a quiet life. I like seeing that they thought about these characters much more than the purpose they serve as foils for the main character. It makes it hard to contain my enthusiasm for this series. But speaking of character, I would have liked to see more of the daily lives of the characters in-game. This far in the series, we started to get more detail, but I feel Deadlocked was a bit of a missed opportunity insofar as diving straight in. I think it could have easily added depth by expounding upon life in the containment suite as an optional 
treat. I do understand that some of this would clash with the high octane action in the main game, but also think that some downtime in between things would have been good for the overall pacing and variety, as the characters went from being one note plays on specific tropes in Ratchet and Clank 1 to having history and real personality in Up Your Arsenal. This is what keeps it from being Ratchet and Clank 4, and instead relegating itself to being contained entirely as a spin-off. Even though the lines from either thing were never that far apart and was still considered to have happened in continuity anyway. The game is pretty short, and aside from the main story beats and a couple extra missions here and there, there isn't actually a whole lot to do, and it remains a straightforward experience. After you beat the game, Challenge Mode, Ratchet and Clank's denomination for New Game Plus, gives you so many unlocks that running through a second time is very tempting. As far as the end game meta, they really did take the cap off and let you get as insanely powerful as you want. One shot can wipe the whole screen of enemies. While it feels like playing with cheat codes on, it's embedded as a natural progression that feels like its own reward. The weapons leveling organically as you use them also leads to a different reward system for playing however you want, as weapon modification and upgrades are half the fun. Messing around with different weapons and making them do different things to suit how you want to play is immediately enjoyable no matter what weapon or tactic you end up on. These games are, however, starting to show their age a bit, mostly because of their length and the non-inclusion of features we now take for granted. Deadlock can be beaten in less than a day. In my most recent case, 10 hours with rapid consecutive deaths on the hardest difficulty. This isn't too bad until you consider that my average run-through time of a normal playthrough is about five hours. The game doesn't really need more broad level setups, but it could use more specific challenges in those levels that are optional. It could also use more optional boss fights, time trials, grab bag objectives, vehicle runs on more maps. There's a lot you could do to add more variety with what is already built into the game engine. Throw in just a few more weapon mods and you could also flesh out the current selection completely. If you find yourself enjoying the gameplay loop already, however, the weapons upgrading from level 1 to level 99 makes it so you continue to replay this game for a very long time. The vehicle sections are as polished as the rest of the weapon selection, and I wish something as fun to pilot as the land Stalker would make a comeback. The particle effects on the plasma motors by themselves could have legitimized or raised for whoever the particle artist was. The vehicles have both primary and secondary weapon functions so they can be used by two players in co-op or multiplayer verses. The combat bot mechanics are extremely well done, especially considering a bunch of games in this era were attempting AI companions for the very first time. While the combat bots don't act on their own except for following you and shooting, that's really all you need them to do by themselves. Everything else they can do is left up to the player. Their super move, their EMP for helping take down turrets, whether you turn a bolt crank to progress in a level or if they do, it's astonishingly well executed. But better than that, it's simple. This way, the bots rarely perform in ways that are frustrating or inhibit the player. This is especially true because there are two of them, and if one goes down, the other will quickly do the action the other one was attempting, while also giving the player a chance to correct themselves. A single button revives them when they take too much damage. If both your bots go down at the same time, an announcer taunts you, serving as a prompt to remind you of your vulnerability. It's really well designed. On the performance side of things, this game pushes the poor PS2 to its absolute limit sometimes. I don't even know how full the disc is. Because of how many things can render on screen, it's absolutely impressive that they managed to push the console this far. After a certain point, there's so much happening that you can't even keep track of it unless you spent an insane amount of time playing this and are used to what to shut out and what to prioritize at any given moment. There was one specific instance during recording where the PS2 actually just ground to a halt. It couldn't handle it anymore. As this particular mission is closing out, it spawns a massive amount of enemies, and if you don't take care of them fast enough, it actually just gives up. The second I pressed the fire button, causing the weapon's effects to go off, everything stopped. No more polygons allowed. Playing on the hardest difficulty requires patience, trial and error, and flexibility. Even then, you'll run out of ammo. A lot. Even if you played it quite a few times, you'll still fail consistently, but won't say you're not having an absurd amount of fun doing it. Everything is coming at you from all sides constantly. How well can you manage chaos? How do you handle it? How do you maneuver, prioritize, and aim all at the same time? I absolutely love video games where you get swarmed and it's nearly impossible to get out without taking a hit. But why does Deadlocked do this so well. Well, let's talk about the controls. Controls and gameplay environment of Ratchet Deadlock are extremely thought out. To explain, 
Your fire and jump commands are mapped to two buttons each. L1 and X for jump, R1 and circle to fire, both at the same time. This means that even if you're playing in the first person, the game is entirely playable without ever having to take your thumbs off of the analog sticks. If you first started playing this in the PS2 era, or if you played any of the other games before it in the series, you will definitely be inclined to use circle to fire and X to jump. But as you get better, you'll see yourself transitioning to other control schemes because the priority of jumping and not taking a hit over dealing damage becomes more pressing over time. It starts by taking your thumb off the aim in order to jump and then transitions to bumper jumper ing. Ah! Someone who could aim and jump at the same time. This is something the series did very well as a whole, making you a better player organically by forcing you to think outside of the box, try new things, and play in different ways, even or especially when environments or enemies get more particular. Now earlier I mentioned the AI companion bots control well. This is still true even though you need to tap the D-pad in order to control them, taking your thumb off of your movement in the process. Why? Well, they account for this in the design. The game places destructible cover you can hide behind for a moment to have the time to take these actions, even on harder difficulties where the window is shorter for dodges because the AI is more precise and predictive. This piece of cover helps high skill ceiling players prevent damage to themselves while they stop moving without becoming an invincible crutch. When you look at enemies' movesets and attacks, they require a good grasp on timing. You commit to certain movement patterns to dodge. Different weapons have different projectile arcs or functions, and prioritizing which weapons to save ammo for from battle to battle means you have to think on your feet. Combining this with the layout of missions, the interspersal of vehicle sections, the ability to skip or come back to challenges later, and the variety of weapon modifications, you have an absolutely huge amount of progression options both in player skill and mechanically. All in all, I could talk for an hour about how dodging missiles and lasers while timing my own shot arcs makes me feel, but I'll sum it up with saying... It makes me feel awesome. The impact Deadlocked had on the series was a sure sign that Ratchet and Clank was going to go in a more skill-focused direction due to how closely it resembled previous entries. What we ended up getting later on in the PS3 was not this direction, but was instead an attempt at changing the Ratchet and Clank franchise into something that was narrative-driven. This transition was messy, in my opinion, as it started with so much change that the cryosleep cutscene in the beginning of Tools of Destruction could easily be misconstrued as a time skip if you forgot the names of which galaxy was which between releases, and from there your entire perception of what's going on would be very confused. This is what happened to me up until I finally looked up the lore on a wiki while writing the script. I was finally able to answer all my unanswered questions like, whatever happened to Angela Cross? Wasn't she a Lombax? What about the Galactic Rangers and the President and Sasha and all that stuff? The title certainly didn't help. Ratchet and Clank future. As their own games reestablish the norms of the series and feel like they're ignoring the events established in previous titles, both narratively and in game feel. It foregoes worrying about a good skill ceiling altogether in order to gain an audience for the next generation and the next story. It is somewhat ironic that a game series whose sole message up to this point was a baseline look at consumerism also occasionally falls victim to the act of commodifying and sanitizing art to appeal to the widest demographic. But that's a completely different topic. I personally don't have a huge problem with this in the long run because the rest of the series is about battling with your origins and the outcomes of your personal choices when you have the power to change the universe at your fingertips, which is a far more in-depth and complicated topic that expounds not detracts from the previous points the series has tried to make. I might save all my other opinions of this topic for a future video, where after retreading the series again, I'll be able to have a more informed and on-topic opinion of this. I think the next logical step in Ratchet and Clank, from a gameplay-only perspective, as it was going at the time of Deadlock, would have been to make the series more challenging more precise, asking more from the player by mixing shooting and platforming sections together in a wider variety of ways that the series already proved was fun and that it was confident at. The audience you spent years building would be older now, and would have the experience from playing previous titles. Insomniac already proved with difficulty selection balance that you could also foster a new audience at the same time. To get particular about suggestions, while the game at a high level does require a lot of precise dodging, there isn't a whole lot of precise platforming mixed with precise shooting and dodging at the same time. While it does exist, it is not prevalent or required to learn 
and is almost always circumvented by the player choosing to slow down. This concept of improving your skill and gear as you go is already part of the series legacy, and would have been a more interesting direction to continue going in for existing fans. Could have been eased into over several titles, as all other mechanics in the series had already. I think if Tools of Destruction had a less messy introduction, that there would not have been such a drastic change in perspective from fans who did not keep up on the deeper lore of the series and had just played the games for their gameplay. However, it is important to understand this entire concept is what makes Deadlocked a spin-off and not a mainline entry. After all, it is called Ratchet Deadlocked, not Ratchet and Clank Deadlocked. I have to be honest and upfront. When I originally wrote this script, I had absolutely nothing negative to say. And maybe some people are of the opinion that it is blasphemy that I do. But there's value to me in these nitpicks. I never thought, as a person interested in game design, I would ever be able to comment on any of the Ratchet & Clank games and be able to offer any suggestion to improve upon them. Growing up, I hailed these games as the absolute pinnacle, each perfect in their own unique way. Ratchet & Clank 2 Going Commando is my favorite game of all time. I thought there was no room for improvement. Now, more than a decade since Kraken Time, I have changed. I now understand their nuance that I was so previously afraid of addressing for the sake of preserving the memory of my favorite game series, and now find myself having a newfound respect for not just Deadlock, but the entire Ratchet & Clank franchise. Game design and technology as a whole have come so far as the art has progressed, that I find myself lucky to be able to look back at these games and say they aren't perfect, be it in design or technical limitation. If we can look to what is ahead of us and eventually create a game that does more, that is indeed a blindingly bright future for game design. At time of writing, it is three days until Rift Apart releases. It is now a long time after that, but I don't own a PS5, so it doesn't matter. For now, I look at Ratchet Deadlocked with a huge amount of reverence and inspiration. I am so proud to be doing a Ratchet & Clank video for my 100 subscriber celebration that is way overdue. Thank you so much for being here. If you find yourself new to the Marching Mecha channel, please consider leaving a like or subscribing so I can continue to do what I do. You can find my other reviews and a playlist on my channel. Thank you so much for watching.